My dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are hoping for a message today on who gets to be married to who after you die, you'll have to wait. I'm not touching that one this morning. Uh, the point of that reading, by the way, isn't that the Sadducees were trying to trick Jesus with it, what they thought was a trick question. The point is he was trying to tell them that there is resurrection. There is a promise of life after this. But I'm drawn to the first reading today, in Job 19. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Hmm. It's 44 days until Christmas Eve. And I say that not to get anyone panicked about it or to warn you about how many shopping days you have left or some nonsense like that. It's just that that scripture that I just shared with you from Job 19 has put me in mind of Christmas Eve. I know it doesn't sound Christmassy, but I'll explain. Christmas Eve, of course, around this joint is pretty hectic to say the least. Yeah? With services at 1.30, 3.30, 5.30, and then 10 o'clock p.m. For those of us leading the festive services, it's a day, right? I mean, it is a day. It's like three days in one day. For me, it begins mid-morning when I'll get here in the quiet before everything kind of jumps off. And every Christmas Eve day I begin as I have for the last three decades. In the quiet of my office, going over my sermon, any last-minute details that I need to think about for the services coming up, while a recording of Handel's Messiah plays in the background. Thirty years ago, I had it on a vinyl LP. And then I got a cassette tape, and then the tape broke, and I got a CD. And then after the CD, now I just stream it on my iPhone. Some things change, but some things don't. They stay the same. The Messiah, which is an oratorio composed by George Frederick Handel, whose picture you see on the screen behind me, composed in 1741, that work has been performed countless times, by countless orchestras and choirs over the last 278 years, and most often right around the Christmas season. Luther College, my alma mater, would perform the Messiah every December under the direction of Weston Noble, who was the Nordic choir director there for over 50 years, with full orchestra, all six choirs in the college, singing as well as any faculty, staff, and members of the student body who wanted to participate in the mass chorus. Oftentimes it seemed like there were more people in the performance than were actually observing and participating uh, that way in the performance. But beyond the sentimentality, I think there's a reason that it's so often performed at Christmas time. All of the words that are sung in Handel's Messiah are lifted directly from Scripture. The entire first movement which proclaims the coming of God's anointed, the Messiah, come almost exclusively from the 40th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. And it begins with those marvelous words, Comfort ye, comfort ye, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, cry to her that she has served her term, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. And then it goes on from there. That's just a lone baritone voice singing that to the whole chorus, singing, Every valley shall be exalted. Every valley, every valley shall be exalted. I can't even do it, but you get the idea. It's a wonderful piece of music to hear. And it goes from there to, And the glory, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And from there it goes leading up to these words of promise from the ninth chapter of Isaiah, For unto us a child is born. For unto us a child is born, unto us 
A son is given unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it goes on like that. Just makes the hair on your arm. I can't do it. But when you listen to a performance, it makes the hair on your arm stand up. And that's how the first movement of the Messiah ends. And the second movement begins, and he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. And the whole second movement is about now how the Messiah has appeared and how the Messiah faces opposition, right? And during his ministry, and it all ends with that magnificent piece of music that you all know by heart, the Alleluia Chorus, right? Everybody's heard that. Alleluia, Alleluia. Hallelujah. It's like the whole realm of heaven singing Alleluia at the resurrection of our Lord. But then, that kind of just plays in the background every Christmas Eve while I'm in my office. But then, the third movement begins. The third movement. It's kind of like the movement for the church. Now that the Messiah has come, now that he has risen from the dead, what happens to people of faith? Well, it starts out with one lone plaintive soprano voice singing the words from Job 19. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. And I'm always caught up by, kind of short by it every year as I'm listening, getting my head into Christmas, kind of getting into that space that I need to be to lead all of you in worship on Christmas Eve. All of a sudden, these stubborn, ornery words of a person who has suffered untold loss, singing out faith in the middle of every reason to doubt. You might not think that's very Christmassy. I think that it is the perfect definition of what we do on Christmas Eve. Job 19, the story of Job. You all know the story of Job? Maybe not. It's one of the most fun stories in the Bible and most powerful. It's not one of those pieces of history that so much of the Bible is. It's not a historical tale. It's more of a morality tale. It's meant to, it's meant to give us a larger truth than simply the words on the page. The story, it's this legend meant to communicate something more deep. And it goes like this. One day, I'll boil it down into a nutshell. One day... All the heavenly beings are coming before God in heaven. And all of a sudden, Hasatan comes up. That's in Hebrew for the accuser. The accuser, Hasatan, Satan. And God says to Satan, the accuser, Hey, where have you been lately? What have you been up to? And Satan says, oh, I've been trying to travel to and fro on the earth, seeing what's up. And God says, Well, in that case, you've seen my servant Job then, right? Satan says, yeah, I've seen Job. God says, I love Job. He's so faithful. He's so righteous. He, he worships me. He knows who he is and he knows who I am. There's no better servant on the face of the earth than Job. And Satan says, well, it's no wonder that he worships you. You give him everything. He's, look at all the flocks he has. Look at all the wealth he has. Look at the big family, seven sons, three daughters, loving wife, reputation in the community, everything a guy could want. You take away any one of those things, God, and he would curse you to your face because that's how human beings are. They're fickle. And God says, I'll take you up on that bet. Do what you want with Job, but do not harm him. Do not touch a hair on his head. And Satan departs from God's presence. Next thing you know, all of a sudden, things are starting to happen to Job. One day, some servants come running in from the field, reporting to him how some enemies have come, stolen all of his sheep, and killed his sheep herders. Then another servant comes running in, same day, tells him all of his cattle have been carried off by the enemies to the east, and all of his cattle herdsmen have been killed. Next thing you know, another servant runs in, tells Job that all of his camels have been stolen away from the enemies to the west, and they've killed all of his camel herders. One by one, all of these riches are being stripped away from Job all at once. Now, you should know, too, that Job's family was righteous. He had seven sons and three daughters. 
And they had a good family life together. Every week, they would gather at one of the son's houses and have a little dinner party every week. Every one of us parents hope that our kids love each other that way, you know, that they'll get together and they'll have fun together. And every week after that party, Job, being the righteous man that he is, would go and sacrifice to God on behalf of each one of his ten children just in case they had done something partying that night, gotten a little out of hand maybe, done something to displease God. That's how righteous Job was. He not only prayed for himself, but he prayed for his children. Well, after Job had lost all of his riches, his cattle, his camels, his sheep, he got word from another servant that at the last night's house party where all of his children were gathered, the house caved in because of a hurricane, the wind that blew up, the whole house fell in, and all of his children are dead. Just like that, Job has lost everything. And Job says those words that you all know, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he wept and he worshiped. The next day, in the council of heaven, all the heavenly creatures were coming in and Satan comes in before God and God says, hey, Satan, what have you been up to? Satan says, oh, I've been traveling to and fro on the earth, up and down on it, checking things out. And then God says, I know you have. And I know what you did to my servant Job. And look, he still worships me. You said he wouldn't, but he still honors me because he knows who he is and he knows who I am. And Satan says, well, yeah, of course he does. You just took away his stuff and his family. But you harm him, you touch his health, he'll curse you to your face. And God says, I'll take that bet. So Satan leaves. God says, you can do anything you want to him, but just do not kill him. Job breaks out in this horrendous rash all of a sudden, boils everywhere, terrible skin condition where he can't rest. He has to take a pot chart and scrape his skin constantly just to get some relief and he sits in ashes all day. And his wife is so disgusted with what's happened to him that she says, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job says to her, that's just what a foolish person would say. I don't know why this has happened to me. And I don't know where God is in the middle of it. But I know that God is still God. And that's when three of his friends come, Job's friends, to try to console him, give him some counsel. And each of those three friends represents that notion that nothing bad could happen to a good person. If something bad happened to you, you must have deserved it. You must have done something to really make God angry. And so they were getting, trying to get Job to confess just confess what you've done. Just admit that somewhere along the line you've tripped up, you've given great offense to God, and God will restore you. And over and over again in the story, Job says, I don't know what to confess. I don't know that I've done anything wrong. And I can't explain why this has happened to me. You see, this story was first given as kind of an antidote to that notion that kind of floats around still to this day that everything happens for a reason. The Bible never says everything happens for a reason. There are some things that happen to you that you can't give a reason for. Stuff happens that leaves us desperately confused, right? And laid low. And that's what this story is about. But at the same time, it lifts up that stubborn righteousness of faith in a God who, even though we can't see him, we're going to grab hold of and not let go of the promise, you see. Because we know who God is and we know who we are. That's what that story is about. So you see, in the middle of all Job's losses, in the middle of all of his pain, he finally comes out with these words to all of those who tell him, you need to confess that there must be something you have done. He says, listen, I know that my Redeemer, my Vindicator lives, and at last he'll stand upon the earth. And even if this my skin is destroyed, even if my insides flow out of me, even if everything is dissipated and gone. Yet I know that God will stand beside me and I will see God at my side and no other. Hmm. You see, surrounded by all sorts of things to fear and to dread and for which to curse God, Job refuses to give up. 
in the most beautiful, ornery faith, he says, I will live because my God lives. Because God lives, I know that I will live. And this is what makes Christmas for me every year. You see, I know people will be here that night. We may average about 400 folks that come into this building each week for worship. Two services Sunday, one Wednesday. But you know what? It's a different 400 every week, right? Different faces. Because on any given Sunday like today, someone's visiting grandma in Sioux Falls, right? Someone's got a kid's volleyball tournament to go to. Someone decided, today I really need to sleep in and watch Face the Nation or whatever. You know, there's always something. And that's the way it is for us. Our schedules are all different. It's always different people. But I know that on that night, on Christmas Eve, the family will gather here. At least those who are in town, right? They will gather here in this place. And from the best seat in the house on that day, I get to stand up here in front facing you during candlelight and silent night, facing a thousand people that day who over the course of the last year I know, some of whom have faced incredible trials. Some of you in the last year have borne unthinkable losses. But you're still here. You'll be here that night singing your faith in a Redeemer who lives, still stubbornly hanging on to Him. And it's a beautiful, ornery faith that believes in resurrected life in spite of every reason to let that faith go. Sometimes our best biblical commentators are not our theologians. They are our musicians. I've never heard a better commentary on Job 19 than Handel's soprano aria in the Messiah, I know that my Redeemer liveth. It's beauty out of pain. It's stubborn faith out of loss. It's there in the strings. It's there in the voice. And finally, it's there in Paul's words from 1 Corinthians, which are tacked on by the composer onto Job's confession. He says, for now is Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. I'd like to let Handel preach it for you right now. As the lights come down, I'm going to invite you to just listen. 